Welcome back to the Mixology Talk podcast. This is episode number 167, and today we will be talking with a bartender who is passionate about hot drinks. Um, this person really understands how to make a hot drink for a beverage menu and has really changed my mind and kind of how I think about hot drinks. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce you, Bradley Thomas Stevens. Everyone, welcome back to the Mixology Talk podcast. Um, if you listen to the last podcast, you'll know that I hate hot cocktails, and I kind of outline many of the reasons why. Um, but I have somebody that actually loves hot cocktails. So, Brad, thanks for joining me, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you uh, for joining us on the podcast. Um, now, before we get started with hot cocktails, um, what got you into bartending? What was the whole uh, premise for you to get into bartending? <laughs> I mean, like most people, uh, you fall into it and then and either you fall in love with it or you run away scared. Um, I, <laughs> I've been in uh, food and beverage since 1994. Mm -hmm. I was uh, work, working as a host. Uh, it's like a, a local chain in uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, kind of similar to Denny's, right? Um, and at the time for that, it was just a paycheck, but I was really good at it. So I uh, eventually I got promoted to management and so on and so forth. and. Uh, uh, and then I, I ran away. I, I was good at it, but I wasn't happy with it. Um, of course, I hadn't been a bartender yet. That was just food and beverage. Mm -hmm. And um, I tried to go to the music industry, moved to L.A. And, and for a lot of people to do that, it eats you up and spits you out most of the time. And it did that to me. Sure. And, uh, so when I came back, I, I did what I knew. I had a friend working at a, a Mexican restaurant uh, owned by the El Torito Company, uh, famous California. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I got a job doing that when I went back to college and, uh, it, uh, it was fun, but the thing, the thing about it was, is I was watching the bartenders there and I was just turning 21, like a couple months and it looked sexier. <laughs> and I just, I, I decided I wanted to bartend and I, I convinced the general manager that I could figure it out. I could learn on the way. And uh, he let me do it. And uh, there was something about socializing, mm -hmm. uh, which actually leads into uh, the reason why I like hot beverages is I, I've always been attracted to the social aspects of uh, bartending uh, community, uh, having the whole neighborhood that would come in, you know, a few times a week uh, to connect with these other people that understood what they're going through in life. And that's a bar community uh, really got me to fall in love with hospitality and, and getting to know these people. Um, and then when I was in college, I started, uh, hanging around fire pits because I had the same kind of environment, you know, and, uh, it, it just, it, it led me in this whole path where I started, uh, the pairing of a hot drink around a fire pit kind of was natural. And I, uh, me and my, my, my best friend rock sand back in college, we would run around trying to find the best fire pits in the entire city of Portland. And, uh, in turn, it ended up being a combination of the menu and the environment. So now I was making a list of who had the best hot toddy, you know? So it ended up being, it was a fun, it was a fun uh, couple of years. And I, uh, I, I think uh, to this day, I, I still find myself pulled every time I see a bar with a fire pit, I'm like, let's go check it out. <laughs> nice. Yeah, absolutely. There's only a handful in the Bay Area that I can remember. Um, but man, they sure are comfortable. You sit there and just have a couple of drinks and just kind of watch some time pass. Well, I mean, it, you have this natural feeling uh, when you're sitting around a fire pit. Um, you end up making friends with everybody mm -hmm. sitting around it. You know, kind of like a bar top. Same thing happens when you sit at the counter of a bar. You make a new friend. Uh, but with that circular, you make, a, you make everybody's your new friend. It, it, even if it, you don't talk to them ever again for that night, that, that's your buddy. Yeah. That's funny, man. Yeah, we, uh, I grew up in uh, Orange County, and we used to do bonfires at the beach, and yeah. a lot of the sim similar uh, feeling to it. Um, but yeah, it definitely brings back some nostalgia for sure. Um, that's crazy. So the, gathering around fire pits was kind of your uh, your catalyst to hot cocktails, huh? Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I, uh, I think it helped that I was single. Also, I didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> that always does it. Oh man, so. Um, what are some of your favorite cocktails that you've uh, you've served in the past or kind of come up with? Uh, when, when in accordance to hot drinks, uh, I mean, I, I've always been a fan of classic hot toddies, uh, you know, uh, Irish coffee, all those the ones that you typically see. But I think uh, the more fun ones uh, are are kind of exploring 
out of the norm. You get excited when you see something that's just a little bit different. Um, so I got excited with uh, like mold ciders and glog mm-hmm. or uh, people who would, who, would, who would take a classic drink and do something more with it. Um, one of my all time favorites is a, it's actually a Portland classic called the Spanish coffee, um, which a lot of people have at least heard of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you order it in most states or other countries, it's usually served with brandy and that's not what the drink is. Um, it's, it's actually a, a really cool drink. Uh, Huber's claims, well, they, they personally don't claim that they invented the drink, but everybody says that they did. Mm. It was actually invented in Mexico and then stolen by a guy who worked at the Fernwood Inn in Milwaukee. And then the guy who owns uh, Huber's stole it in the 70s from them. Um, but it's, uh, it's a fire drink. So they set the thing on fire, caramelized the sugar rim, cinnamon and nutmeg, all the whole show and everything uh, with uh, Kahlua and orange liqueur. Um, ends up, they're the world's largest buyer of Kahlua too. So people like it. <laughs> nice. Well, and there's a whole spectacle around this particular uh, cocktail as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Kind of touched upon it and you light the light it on fire. Uh, mm-hmm. But the cinnamon and nutmeg, once they're like really ground fine, they kind of start throwing sparks when they, when they hit the flame, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, you know, the fragrance too. When people see the fire, but then they smell this burning cinnamon and nutmeg, uh, everybody in the room starts ordering one. And that's something that's really fun about it. Not only do you get a little bit of a spectacle, um, but you, you get this entire attention uh, of, of this one item that everybody in the building now wants to try. So that's really good from an ownership level as well as it, all I got to do is sell one of these and then we're good for the rest of the night. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's definitely a cocktail theater, hot drink theater for sure. Yes. Um, my, my personal favorite is, is going to be the uh, Glog though. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Scandinavian mold wine. Um, something I've been making for events for years. And uh, funny enough, I was, I was looking at social media today and, and punch magazine posted the Glog. <laughs> That's funny. I'm going to talk about that in like an hour. Uh, <laughs> They, it, the Scandinavians didn't invent it. Um, I mean, uh, Chile has a, a version of it. Um, you know, uh, Glowvine in, in Germany, Glogi in Finland, everybody's got a mold wine. But uh, the thing I like about the Scandinavian uh, version is they, they're more likely to spike it. And, and whether it's Aquavit in Sweden or whiskey or mm-hmm. cognac in, uh, in Finland, um, it, it's got a nice kick to it. And, and the reason why they call it uh, Glowvine all the glow also means glow um, is because of the way it makes you feel when you drink it. And, and there's nothing better than like standing out in the snow, having a glass of that, you know, I don't care if you sing Christmas carols, if you're just staring at the pretty sky, it, it right. feels good. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's like an internal blanket, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, what do you typically put in your glogs? Like, uh, can you tell us some of the ingredients that you typically throw in there? Yeah, absolutely. I actually, uh, have my recipe right here. Oh, cool. um, I actually, uh, when I was originally starting to make log, I, I lived in Finland for uh, a short time. A friend mm-hmm. of mine owns a brewery over there. I was supposed to help him run it. And then uh, immigrating is hard. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I, uh, I, I tried some of the, the, you know, the instant ones where you just buy a spice bag and put it in a bottle of wine and let it sit for a little while. Uh, and that was all right, but it didn't really have the, the feeling of like when you're in Helsinki with a, a cup from, you know, grandma just made, you know, there was something very special about that. And mm-hmm. I, uh, I went to, I, I don't know if you've heard of them, uh, 12 bottle bar. They, they've got a website, it's a blog. It's, I don't think they're anything major, but they, they, they're, they're fun to read. Um, and I yeah, actually they wrote looked a at book, them. right? Uh, yeah, they published absolutely. a couple of years. Yeah. It's called 12 bottle bar the book. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Um, and, uh, they, uh, they, they had a, a recipe on there that I actually looked at and I tried making theirs, uh, for the first time and it was pretty dang good. Um, mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've altered mine, uh, you know, to personalize it a bit. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you're one thing that's really important with those is the raisins and the blanched almonds. And a lot of people freak out about it the first time. Cause they're like, why is there things floating at the bottom of my cup? Um, but it's amazing. It's like you have a little snack at the bottom waiting for you when you're done. <laughs> And it's crazy. The raisins, if you let them sit in there long enough, they'll absorb all of the, the wine uh-huh. and they'll re-plump into grapes. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I usually, so cool. I'm usually going to, you know, it's going to be red wine. Um, if you want to do the Chilean one, you can use a South Blanc. If you want to, uh, you know, uh, do the Scandinavian port. Um, I prefer like a Shiraz, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do cardamom pods, cloves, cinnamon. 
Um, I, I do take 12 bottle bars, uh, uh, idea of doing an oleo sacrum from, uh, Dave Wondrich's recipe is what they use. Mm -hmm. Um, I do my own, which is similar. Um, and then, um, I spike mine with either cognac or whiskey. Um, and then also I add a little bit of clear Creek's cassis because that, uh, black currant flavor goes really well with Shiraz. Yeah. And they do a hell of a job. I love their, uh, their, um, distillates that they come up with. They do it. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're wonderful. And they, they started out as a winery. So oh, nice. they, 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 they work well with uh, wine cocktails. Uh, nice. I think. <laughs> Perfect. Well, that sounds delicious. I know, uh, especially for the, uh, for the winter and the fall, uh, so yeah. like quite the drink to have now, um, when you're serving, uh, is this something you serve at your bar, uh, glog, um, or is this something a little bit more for special events and, uh, around the house? Well, and that's something, um, you know, I do it for events. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, my current bar program, I'm not using it in the one in Portland. We absolutely will use it in the winter time. hundred mm -hmm. percent. Um, and, uh, that kind of depends on your service. You know, uh, we talked before the interview a little bit about, um, you know, what people have options to, right? Like some people work in a dive bar. They don't have access to a hot water pump. They don't have access to a coffee maker. They don't have access to a lot of things that are required for hot beverages. Right. Um, but there is a situation where you have to decide if you want to batch it, you know, and, um, batching is difficult. Um, one of the big differences between a cold drink and a hot drink, uh, where dilution is very important in a cold drink, evaporation is very important in a hot drink, right? right. Um, the, 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 the three things that are really, really, really important, um, with hot drinks is, uh, what was this guy's name? Uh, a guy from University of California did a study on it. It was actually brilliant. Um, although it seems so simple, um, you, it's going to be the temperature and the time um, and uh, uh, whether or not you cover it up. I mean, it, it, it's so silly, um, but you can cook something for two and a half hours, right? Mm -hmm. Uncovered on a, a, a normal temperature and you'll evaporate 95% of all the alcohol in the cocktail, right. right? So you have to have the right equipment. So when you're building this, you have to keep that in mind, make sure that you're tasting it as it goes, make sure it's the right palate that you want the drink to be in. But also when you're storing it for service, you need to have something that has a tight lid so it doesn't evaporate, it doesn't have a burner so it doesn't destroy the cocktail right. and can maintain the heat for several hours for service. Um, so I always recommend people to get a, um, a commercial hot beverage dispenser you can buy one from like Bun for a hundred bucks, you know, sure. but, but read reviews. <laughs> um, Sounds like you've been burned on that one before. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's actually very literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Well, kind of uh, on the same note, is there any um, vital uh, pieces of equipment? Uh, you kind of touched a little, uh, upon it a little bit for hot water dispenser, espresso yeah. machine or anything like that. Um, is there any other critical pieces of equipment that you would highly recommend um, people have behind the bar if they're considering rolling out a hot beverage program? Sure. I mean, it depends on, again, on, on um, what tools you have available and also what drink you're doing. If it's a hot toddy and you have a hot shot and it's reliable, you're good, mm -hmm. right? If it's a coffee cocktail, you probably don't need to batch it. I mean, there are exceptions. Just uh, uh, make sure that you don't have to walk all the way around the building to get there. Mm -hmm. The important thing if you're going to batch a hot cocktail, though, um, is be prepared. Let your customers know this is something that's going to sell out. Right? Be, be ready for that. And you want to get a commercial hot beverage dispenser, probably. Um, gallons and liters depend on the size of your program. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that it's insulated with a tight lid, no burner. Pour spout preferred over the pump. You know, when you go in the gas station, you get that pump coffee. Right. It's not very reliable for, for bartending. It's probably okay if you're in a neighborhood bar with 40 seats or less. But, you know, if you're doing high volume, large seated, uh, you don't want to deal with that. Um, a good carafe is honestly good for most, most programs, but you need to read the reviews and make sure you're getting a carafe that can hold the temperature for hours and hours. Right. Funny enough, I can't remember the model of Panasonic actually makes uh, a carafe that's got this insulated technology that will keep your uh, coffee or hot water for like two days. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, 
I, I, I don't have the notes on it, but I, I actually, I used it before uh, when I was overseas in Japan Yeah, and it was insane. I, I actually like, I was just like pouring the coffee like the next day after I closed and everybody's like, that's yesterday's coffee. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it held up fine. I mean, it, the, it's, oh, it was, it, it was like 150 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's incredible, man. That's crazy. Well, I know what I'm asking Santa for Christmas. That sounds amazing. Yeah, go to <laughs> Japanese Amazon, right? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Uh, that's really cool. All right. Well, that's uh, definitely some good stuff on the, um, the, equipment side now like uh you touched on the irish coffee which is kind of its own animal right when we talk mm -hmm. about service and um the details of that i know that cream is you can go down a research hole on what <laughs> specifically is in their cream but as far as like making whipped cream like behind the bar yeah. if you're doing that um do you have any specialized special tools you use um i mean isi uh, for for life you know mm -hmm. isis are, are are fantastic um, and, and they save you a lot of headache. Um, it, it, it depends on what kind of cream you're making though. Like I did a, um, a mold cider for makers, Mark and R and DC a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. we had a big event for their salespeople. And, uh, that, that, that was really nice. I just, you know, cooked everything in a, uh, slow cooker and mm -hmm. then I spiked it later on so that it didn't evaporate. Um, and, uh, my whipped cream I used for that was a blue cheese maple whipped cream with lemon zest. Yeah freaking delicious but, awesome. but when you when you deal with that stuff it's temperamental it means i have to make it for that service and then i have to throw it out um right. if, if i was to serve it the next day you would have little curds at the bottom that are going to give the texture to people that is very unpleasant sure but if you're doing like let's say like do you're doing a, a lemon cocktail and you want to do like a, a lavender uh whipped cream you can you can do something really simple with that um, and just, uh, toss it in your, your ISI, the maybe lavender bitters, or you have a lavender simple syrup, whatever it is you're using for that, mm -hmm. uh, with the heavy cream and load, double, double charge it and you're good to go. You know, sure. and that lasts yeah. for pretty much an entire day. You can probably use that particular one mm -hmm. probably two days if you could. Uh, I wouldn't do it more than two days, but yeah, absolutely. You, you can be fine. And, and, and honestly, that's one of the things when you walk into the bar, before you even make a drink, you walk through and, and you check those things. Sure. You know, you know Absolutely. It, it's pretty, that's two seconds and it, it, it's so worth it to make sure you get that product out there. Right. Um, now when we talk about like the significant differences between creating a, uh, like concepting out and creating a hot cocktail versus a cold cocktail, um, is there any major adjustments that you usually apply to, um, when you create hot cocktails? Yeah. I mean, I can go back to the evaporation real quick because that's mm -hmm. something that I, I think it needs to really be put in there is alcohol evaporates at uh, 172 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Where water does it to 212. And we already talked about how fast that can happen. Now you shouldn't be scared of that because a little bit of evaporation is going to soften up the palate, right? Sure. And that's actually going to make it so it's more accessible. And if you're doing a low ABV program, then that's even better, right? right? It gives you an option. It gives you an option for and that's something a lot of people are doing right now but there is a certain point with a hot cocktail where it can be completely spoiled because you've overcooked it right but like um this is okay this is a great example i made a chicha recently chicha is not a hot beverage it's a classic peruvian thing but you you actually cook it um and then chill it for service mm -hmm. and um i made the exact same recipe three times and each time well the first two times i should say it came out different. The first time it was perfect. It was bold and rich. And what you do is you're cooking purple corn with cinnamon and pineapple husks and all this stuff. And it, it, it was absolutely wonderful. I got excited. I made a second batch for our event and it was watery and mm. boring. Of course, I, I, I discovered that before service because you need to check your stuff. Right. But, but it, what, what happened was is that I got excited and I didn't check my work. When you're making cold cocktails, you can make a daiquiri right now. You don't have to taste it. You know you made it perfectly, right? You can pour it out and just hand it to me. Mm -hmm. But with, with a hot beverage, there's so many different aspects of uh, where it can go wrong that you need to actually, you can't just put it on the burner and walk away. You need to go back there just like you're cooking as a chef and, and taste it throughout. And sometimes even though you swear it's on the same heat setting on the same burner in the same pot, you're going to find yourself in trouble right. if you don't check on it consistently. 
Um, so I had to cook it a little bit longer. That was it. The chicharrada was perfect after about 15 minutes of cooking. Sure. So yeah. just blew off some more water and then condensed it a little bit and it was condensed it. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and that's the thing uh, that I'll sound like a broken record is the evaporation and, and dilution are, are the, the two key factors for a balanced cocktail. Um, sure. When, when you're looking at the differences. Now um, I was going to ask you a question about that. Um, and I totally forgot it. So when you're concepting out a cocktail and before you put it on a, a cocktail menu, is this something that you'll go through like, a faux service where you get the mm -hmm. you get the pre batch ready or whatever. However, you're going to create this cocktail. Um, let's say you are batching it, and you just let it cook throughout service and taste it. I mean, or do you? Yeah, no. That's the point of having the right equipment. Is you don't have to taste it throughout service as okay. long as you have it in the right equipment. Sure. Um, and and uh, I, I like to think um, some people find hot cocktails to be a big headache, especially if you're doing um, single service right. per order. Um, you know, that guy who's making a peppermint patty with hot cocoa and he can't stir the cocoa powder just right. You know, he's got those chunks floating at the top. That's a, no bartender wants to do that. Right. You know, and, and I don't care if you're using powder or if you're in a higher program and you're, you're, you're importing Columbia chocolate and melting it down in a double boiler. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, the, uh, the thing when you, when you're putting together any menu is you have to look at what can I do before we open so that I don't have to work hard later. And that's actually where hot beverages can help your program a lot is that, yeah, it's a little bit prep heavy, mm -hmm. but you should be able to deliver this product very fast, faster than a, a margarita. Sure. You know? um, and at that point you, you get into the garnishing and plating just like anything else. Um, and then that changes, you know, uh, up to you of how hard you want to work, you know? Absolutely. Now this is a kind of a good transition point. Um, is there any, so once you kind of go from a cold cocktail to a hot cocktail, is there anything specific about a hot cocktail that um, for garnishing or presentation that is not available to you for, let's say uh, margarita or a daiquiri or a cold cocktail that you'd like to utilize? There, there are a lot of garnishes that, that overlap, right? I can mm -hmm. put a dehydrated apple uh, slice in, into a hot beverage and it'll be beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the point of garnishing uh, is why is it there, right? Right. Um, it started out, you know, garnishing started out with, you know, a lime wedge on the side of a vodka tonic. And that was an option. Do you want to squeeze it in there? Right. Um, and, and, and or an orange peel in an old fashioned. Um, it has to contribute something. Uh, being beautiful is definitely important. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you're looking at, you know, uh, Don the Beachcomber put mint in almost everything because it smelled so good. That you're already excited before you even take your first sip of a, a zombie or whatever. Um, but, uh, hot cocktails are naturally fragrant. You've already got that going for it. You don't need to worry about the fragrance for your garnish. Mm -hmm. So at that point you can start looking at when, when I put something on here, is it just cause it looks good in a photo or is it something that is going to make this drink more enjoyable? Now, a lot of times you're going to look at with like the Irish coffee or, or a mold cider people or whatever might put like a, a whipped cream topping. That's pretty popular. But if you don't want to have it become more sweet, then you need to start looking at maybe your glassware. You know, I spend a lot of time with a lot of my hot drinks. I'll go to the secondhand store and pick up a bunch of old teacups from grandma's with saucers. And, and maybe um, I hate going too far into pairing with food, mm -hmm. but like with my glog, I'll do like a little gingerbread cookie guy on the side, nice. you know, and, and, and little things like that. Um, we did a, uh, a, a hot toddy on a menu back in Oregon a few years ago. Uh, where it was uh, apple, rosemary, and baking spices, uh, you know, that we would let sit for 48 hours and fuse. And, you know, back then, uh, now everybody does it, but, you know, a rosemary twig just sitting in the glass, in a beautiful glass with that nose coming up, that was enough. People saw mm -hmm. it, they got excited, they wanted it, you know. So I, I think just with any cocktail you make, you just need to think, why am I doing this? Sure. You know, yeah. if I put a flower on top of it, uh, maybe that's cool, but you're not going to drink through a straw in a hot drink. So that now that flower is in my way when I'm trying to enjoy it. Right. Well, and it's probably going to die within, you know, 10 minutes. It's going <laughs> to yeah. look pretty sad. And all of a sudden, that whole cocktail experience is like, what? Mm -hmm. That's gross. I don't want to drink this. <laughs> that, that's also very important uh, because you know, imagine that flower like tea, the, because it's a hot beverage, you're going to start absorbing the flavor of what you put in there. Right. So you don't, you don't want to have maybe like the bitter flavors of the stem of that flower or, or anything else that might be on there to 
throw off the balance of your cocktail. And now they're like, Oh, I thought I liked this, like this drink, but now it's gross. Yeah. And that's a really good point. Like when, when you're talking about cold cocktails in few, like you're, if you have a garnish that's, that has a lot of flavor and a lot of aroma, it's not going to pull off that those no. oils or anything. Cold, cold fusions take a lot more time. <laughs> right. Exactly. So when we're talking about hot cocktails, I never even thought about the possibility that your garnish is going to start to throw off um, the flavors of your drink. Mm-hmm. The longer it's yeah. It makes total sense. So yeah, I guess you have to be pretty particular about um, some of the garnishes and to your point, taste it before service and make sure that it's actually yeah. going the direction that you want it to go. I was, uh, I was in Vegas a couple months ago and uh, I, went to, I went to a bar I won't name, but they served me a, uh, a hot beverage. It was a coffee beverage, it was very delicious. But they, uh, they actually put a rosemary twig right in the, in the cup Mm-hmm. They took a torch and they lit it on fire. And I know they, you know, it's Vegas. They're just trying to do a showmanship thing. But all I could think was this drink smells so good. I wish this smoky smell wasn't in the way. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> it was like, it was like somebody I just lit a cigar next to me and I, I, I enjoy a cigar every once in a while. But at the moment I was trying to enjoy that cup. <laughs> right. Absolutely. That's funny. Like, yeah. Points for presentation. Minus points for actual, like, contributing to the cocktail. Well, 80% of your palate, right? It's right. It's right there in your nose. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, man. So, we kind of on this, on this subject. Do you have any um, kind of taboos or things you just don't do with hot cocktails? Or let's say you're at a, a bar and you see somebody executing a hot cocktail program, like some pet peeves around that. Yeah, I hate... Um, I hate when I go to a bar and I see a bartender uh, serving up, you know, it's, it's almost always going to be the hot toddy, right? Um, but serving up any hot beverage uh, without warming the glass first. It's like, cool, cool. Uh, I, you just guaranteed that my drink's 10% colder. <laughs> That's funny. We actually just talked about that, I think, yesterday. My wife and I, uh, yeah, heating the glass, yeah. And that can make all the difference in the world, right? Because the thing about a hot cocktail is you want or a hot drink, you want it hot. You don't yeah. want it, I like, mean, unless somebody warm. asks, they want it tepid, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, man. So, so much possibility and so, uh, so close. <laughs> hot cocktail is supposed to warm you, to warm you up, uh, not just because uh, you're holding it and it's cold outside, but it's supposed to increase the body temperature completely. Mm-hmm. And that's a great feeling uh, when you're hanging around Christmas or, or in February when the winter really kicks in. I know in California, you don't get much of one, but... <laughs> For the rest of us, it's it's one of the best feelings in the world, you know, right. that cold air, and you just hold that cup up right next to you, and it's uh, it makes the whole evening. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, any ingredients that you usually don't work with with hot cocktails? So? <sighs> well, I wouldn't say there's any ingredients I don't work with. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that I'd be more careful with um, any any stemmed things. Um, it's kind of similar with muddling. Um, if you over muddle, say mint, you get the bitterness from the stems. It's the same thing of leaving your tea bag in the coffee for too long. Uh, again, that's also why you end up standing in front of the pot. If you want to have the best pot cocktail available, especially with mold things is if you let the tea sip, uh, seep for too long, you get those bitter flavors that you don't want. Um, so I think, uh, a really good thing to do, uh, is kind of experiment. Um, I, a lot of people, have. Uh, read uh dave arnold's you know liquid intelligence right sure Mm -hmm. a lot of people own it and don't read it also but um you know uh, one of the things that made that book really famous was uh his his ability to use this not just for bar but also kitchen is it it talked about using classic pairings don't be scared to try ingredients um you know i put blue cheese in my last cocktail and my wife is like you're insane i'm like but don't you it's fantastic, you know. Um, just don't experiment on your customers. Experiment on yourself. Try it out a few times, and then give one for free to a customer who you know will come back if it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing should ever go on your menu unless twenty people have drank it and said, "Yeah, this is great." <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's just good, good advice right there. <laughs> Perfect. I, I really don't think there's anything out there that isn't worth experimenting with, though. Right. You just you just got you got to use your brain. I, I usually like with mold things. I usually use a cheesecloth where I put all the herbs in there. Um, anything that I think if overcooked can have a negative flavor. 
Mm-hmm. That way, if like, let's say you put apricots in your mold wine and the apricot flavor isn't getting there yet, you can pull all of the stuff that might give a negative flavor out and then let it just sit with the apricots for a little longer. Sure. Yeah. yeah and that, 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 that's something where you're protecting yourself um, from uh, having to throw a batch out or throwing a party at your house that costs you a lot of money. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, that's very true. Absolutely. Um, perfect. All right. Uh, well, is I can't thank you enough for your time, man. I think I'm kind of convinced I need to take another stab at hot drinks. <laughs> uh, you, you've I, definitely piqued my interest for sure. <laughs> I think uh, what you need to do is uh, make make a, a small batch in a slow cooker mm-hmm. and, and let some of that alcohol cook, cook off. You know, uh, you told me before the reason, one of the reasons why you don't like hot alcoholic beverages is that the alcohol is too much in your face. Right. Allow, allow some of the ABV to burn off where you can still have that wonderful flavor mm-hmm. of the alcohol, um, but it won't hit you as hard. And I think you might change your mind. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I, I think I ranted about this on the last podcast uh, was, you know, that that first initial hit is all just alcohol vapor. And it's just kind of right up in your face. From my experience, we were doing, we never did batched. We always did uh, a la minute. So, um, yeah. you know, that alcohol was just super aggressive. and It's, it's undiluted. Right. And it's, it's hot. So, you know, it's just yeah. going to start to blow off. So, um, <laughs> but that makes a ton of sense. Just to, like you said, you know, dilution is one thing for cold cocktails. Evaporation, on the other hand, um, for the hot cocktails, it makes total sense. So I think you're going to have to go back to the drawing board and, uh, and yeah. try, a, try a glog or a, a toddy that might have been sitting around for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, like I said, man, I can't, uh, I can't thank you enough for all the time you spent with us. Is there anything um, you have coming up that you're excited about you want to share with everyone? Um, I, uh, I, I, I told you before we started, I do have a, a bar that I'm, uh, if you can see all the boxes behind me, I'm moving to Portland, Oregon in a few days to open a bar. Um, I can't talk about it too much um, sure. because my investors would get mad at me. Um, but uh, uh, take, uh, keep your eyes open for American Troubadour PDX. Uh, that'll be the, the name of the spot. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, I'll come back on your show again in the future and I can talk more about it. Yeah, no, that'd be awesome, man. We definitely, uh, definitely like that. And then, um, if people have questions about hot cocktails or anything, um, do you have a favorite social media platform? Yeah, and I'll I'll send you the links for it because people always misspell my name. Um, okay. But uh, I me, mean, uh, Facebook, it's just Bradley Thomas Stevens. Uh, that's mostly my personal stuff, but I do bar st- bartending stuff on there as well. Mm-hmm. The main one for bartending is going to be Instagram, and that's at Bradley T, uh, T. Stevens. And that's S T E P H E N S. I often get confused for the coach of the Boston Celtics, uh, <laughs> though he spells his last name different than me. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we'll uh, definitely include those links in the show notes. And once again, man, uh, I hope you have a nice, easy move. Uh, I hope you have a great holiday season, and uh, we'll definitely keep in touch um, when uh, your bar gets a little bit closer to open. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right. Cheers, man. Cheers. So thanks again to Bradley Thomas Stevens, not only for his time, but his understanding uh, and his ability to kind of teach hot drinks. He definitely changed my mind and uh, kind of how I approach hot beverages. And I really, really do appreciate it. So Bradley Thomas Stevens is one of many bartenders in one of our Facebook groups. Uh, We actually have two, one for enthusiasts or people that are just interested uh, in getting started with with craft cocktails. And we have a professional industry focused one as well. You can find both groups over at abarabove.com slash groups. And we're having fun and exciting conversations every day. So once again, thanks to everybody in that group, especially thanks to Bradley Thomas Stevens. And we'll have some more podcasts for you in the future. But until then, cheers, everyone.